Today we'll talk about the pigeonhole principle. This is huge. This is a very, very important thing. Like I said before, a lot of proofs are done by contradiction as a proof technique. This is a very nice method of proof that is used to solve some very, very important things. So let's talk about it. What is the pigeonhole principle? Uh, on the left here, I have a bunch of pigeons. We can also call them items. And on the right, we have pigeonholes, which we can also call containers. Pigeonholes are just places where pigeons go. And the answer, and the question is, when we distribute these pigeons into the pigeonholes, what do we see? What is something that we always see? Okay, let's, let's do this. Let's put this one in here. Let's put this one in here. Let's put this one in the first one and this one down here. So then we have a three, zero, one distribution. That's nice. So now I say, well, okay, actually I want to distribute all these pigeons, but only have one in each box. So we say, oh, okay, let's put this one in here, this one in here, this one in here. Oh, crap. What do I do with this extra one? Well, yeah, let's break the rules and just put it in this one box up here. So we have a 2 one, one distribution here, and the pigeonhole principle states that if you have more pigeons than pigeonholes, there's always going to be one pigeonhole with more than one pigeon in it. And I think that's something that's pretty obvious, but we generalize it a little bit more than that. And we say that if we have M items, and we have N containers, if it's the case that the number of items is greater than the number of containers, there is at least one container with the ceiling of M over N items. And I should mention that the ceiling of M over N what it does is, if you have a number x point, say, some values, y, z, w, so on and so forth, what it does is it outputs x plus 1. So it just rounds the number up. So previously we saw we had four items in three containers. This is equal to 1.3333, so on and so forth. But then the ceiling function rounds it up to two. So there's at least one container with two pigeons in it. What if we had 10 items in four containers? Well, that means there's at least one container with three items in it. Of course, there can be more. We can distribute it so all 10 items are in one container. But what we're saying is that we'll never get a distribution that has less than three items in any container or less than you'll never have a distribution where there are less than three items in all of the containers it's not going to happen so here's a question what do we do with it we have this really cool sort of intuitive knowledge of this pigeonhole principle what can we prove with it well here's an interesting application if you have a group of n people and they may be strangers, they may be friends, they may know everybody, they may be unsociable, maybe one of them's a serial killer and doesn't really like anybody. Uh, there's always going to be two people who have an identical number of friends within the group. Well, that's pretty cool. Okay, so to give a nice example, I'm going to pick four people here. And we're going to label them just as one two, three, and four. I'm going to put arrows to represent the friendships here. Okay, well, one is going to be friends with two, one is going to be friends with four, three is going to be friends with four, and okay, it's kind of nice. Uh, what we see here is that we sort of take the degree of the amount of lines we have going out. So we say, okay, well, one has two friends, mainly two and four. Two has the friend one and one only. Four has friends three and one, so this will be two, and three has one friend. Okay, so we did a quick little example just to show how this works, and let's abstract it a little bit more. So we know there are n people. 
Okay. These are the items. Now, how many friends can each person possibly have? And the answer is that each person can have between 1 and n minus 1 friends. Okay, so for instance, if you're this person here, then if you're friends with everybody, you're going to have exactly n minus 1 friends. Okay, so how many elements is n minus 1? Well, when you take the pigeonhole principle, you take each of these numbers is sort of like a container where you assign a value to each of the n people and it's in one of these containers either they have one friend or two friends or three friends all the way up to n minus one friends so what you see is you have n people that can take in n minus one different containers and by the pigeonhole principle this means that there are at least two people that have the same amount of friends or there are at least two values that are going to be in the same container because if you distribute let's let's distribute n minus one people so let's say person one has one friend person two has two friends all the way up to person n minus one which has n minus one friends well then we have this person here n this last person and he has to have either one friend, or two friends, or three, four, five, six, all the way up to n minus one friends. He can't have less than that, he can't have more than that. We assume that everybody has at least one friend. We are not considering the case where you can have zero friends, okay? If anyone was thinking, oh, what about zero friends? Well, no, everybody has a friend here. And we have a proof that at least two people have the same amount of friends. So. It's kind of cool. It's a little application we can do that sort of is a real world problem. For instance, here's another cool little example. If you have a group of 366 people, at least two of them have the same birthday. And this is sort of intuitive, but here's the thing. It's always going to be greater than or equal to two. So you may have it that your group has 365 people with the same birthday. That still holds. What we're saying is that at least two people will have the same birthday. Always. And I think that's, that's kind of a cool thing that we can abstract sort of mathematically and say, okay, well, here's a nice principle for it. It's kind of intuitive, but there's a nice principle. Here's an application that is not always so obvious. Let s equal the numbers 1 through 20. And we're going to say, if we pick 11 numbers, we're guaranteed that the sum of two picked numbers is 21. This is a little bit, you know, well, how, how do I prove this? How do I make containers? Like, what are the containers that we set up? So we have one, we have the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way up to the number 20. Okay, well... Why don't we pair up all the combinations, or all the sets, that make the number 21 when we add them together? So we have 1 and 20, we have 2 and 19, we have 3 and 18, we have 4 and 17. Of course, remember these are sets, so these are not ordered sets. Okay, 6 and 14. Wait, I'm going to 20... 1, so that should be 5 and 16, 6 and 15, 7 and 14. I'm going to write them all out just for uh, illustrative purposes, 9 and 12, and then we finally have 10 and 11. So all of the elements I've listed here are part of the set. I have not forgotten any elements, and these are all the possible combinations that make up the number 21. We're going to pick 11 numbers, and we're going to prove that one of them has a pair that equals 21. So let's pick our numbers very specifically. So I want to disprove this. So I'm going to pick 1 in the first set, 2, 3, 
4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. So I have a set of 10 numbers where if you add up two of them, none of them equal 21. But I said I have to pick 11 numbers, which means that this 11th number has to come from one of these sets. But if I pick an 11th number from any of these sets, then I'm going to have a pair of numbers that equal 21. If I pick 19, I'm going to have 2 and 19, and that'll make 21. Uh, if I pick 12, I'll have 9 and 12, which makes 21. So we've proven that if we pick 11 numbers, then uh, we're going to get the pair that adds up to 21. It has to happen. If we pick 12 numbers, the same thing will happen. If we pick 17 numbers, the same thing will happen. And what we've done here is we've said, okay, what is... Well, it's a little bit more abstract since you're saying, well, wait, isn't this just the floor of 11 over 20? And that would be wrong because what we actually have here is we're picking 11 numbers out of 10 containers or 10 pigeonholes, which we see here is equal to 2. And that's a little bit more confusing at first since you're saying, hey, well, wait, there's 20 numbers. Well, you have to put them into sets first. And that is the one application that maybe isn't so obvious. In fact, what you can do further with these questions is say, well, we have some prime divisors of certain numbers, we have multiples of certain numbers, and you can prove some pretty crazy things with this stuff. If you have any specific questions you want me to prove with the pigeonhole principle, you can leave them in the comments below. What I really like as far as questions are when you have, say, a grid, let's say we have a nice a square grid, so this is going to be something that looks like this. We're going to assume they're all equal distances apart, and I say, okay, well, let's give them all lengths of, I don't know, let's say each of these are going to be two centimeters, so you have something like this, and I say, okay, Given 17 dots, there are always going to be, or there is going to exist, two dots within, uh, the square root of 8 centimeters. So that's kind of cool. That's actually a pretty, uh, a pretty crazy proof when you think about it. Given an 8 by 8 square, no matter where you put the dots, there's always going to be two dots within root 8 of a centimeter together. And that's kind of cool. In fact, I was nice, and I said, okay, here's a grid. And I gave you 16 little squares, and when I say 17 dots, well, it's kind of obvious that at least one of these squares has to have two dots. But why would I do that? Why would I give you that information? Why don't I just say, okay, here's an 8 centimeter by 8 centimeter box, uh, prove that with 17 dots, you're always going to get a pair of dots that are less than the root 8 centimeters apart. It's pretty crazy, right? It's kind of a little bit more difficult when I say, okay, there's an 8 centimeter by 8 centimeter square. It's a little bit more challenging there. In fact, what if, what if I even took this out and I said, okay, I want two dots less than root 8 centimeters. Here's the question. What is the minimum number of dots that are required to do this? And that's even crazier, because now I'm saying, okay, let's, let's reverse engineer the problem. Don't just prove that a certain number of dots is required to be this distance. I'm saying, okay, I want two dots that are within this range, no matter where you put them, how many dots do I need to do that? It's, yeah, it's a little bit crazy. It's a little bit crazy when you think about it. But what you have to do, really, is in this question you have to say, okay, well, I know the diagonal distances are the furthest possible, which is root 8, and what this means is that it's going to be, really, the root of 2 squared plus 2 squared, so clearly we must have a 2 by 2 here. So we fill this up with a bunch more 
two by two boxes. Okay, so these are all two by two boxes. We see there's 16 boxes. So what I want is I want the ceiling of n over 16 to equal 2, and I want the smallest n to do that. Therefore, n has to be 17. Now clearly this is a little bit easier to do because I've shown you the original problem than reverse engineered a problem and showed you how to get the answer of the original question, which is a very convoluted way in English of saying, uh, I basically gave you the answer before and it's really easy to reverse engineer, but similar problems like this you'll probably see on exams. And they're really good problems because they require you to think about the pigeonhole principle in ways that you probably never thought of it before. So that was the PHP. Really important stuff for proofs. Uh, I didn't include it in the proof section because I think it's good to give your brain a little bit of a rest. This normally comes at the end of the course, comes with counting, comes with some other stuff. And it's nice to be reminded after not doing proofs for a while of, you know, a little bit of practice, then you learn something new. And, you know, this is nice. Uh, next time we're going to start doing division, number theory. That's going to be a lot of fun. Not really. Sort of. Eh. Some people like it, some people hate it. Elementary number theory is a very, very fun course, and we'll go into a lot more depth than we do here. So if you enjoyed, I suggest taking, checking it out. But uh, that was the pigeonhole principle. That is for sure the end of proof techniques in discrete math one.